Good evening, everybody, and a really warm welcome to the Fifth Estate this evening. My name's Sally Warhaft, and look, it's just always great to have an American with us, uh, and particularly uh, somebody as uh, accomplished and experienced, and what a story to tell as our guest this evening. Uh, he's the only guest we've ever had at the Fifth Estate who's had a designated seat on Air Force One. Uh, he, he was, among other uh, roles at the White House, a senior writer and deputy director for messaging for President Barack Obama, and now the author um, of a fabulous book, uh, West Winging It, My Time in President Obama's White House. It's not even available yet in Australia. We are so hot off the press here at the Wheeler Centre. Uh, but you can pre-order it. Um, and I think it's available in, uh, eighth, on the 8th of May. So please give Pat Kinane a very warm Wheeler welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to just set the scene for you a little bit about the rooms that Pat has been in, the moments in time. He was uh, backstage in Chicago on the night of Obama's uh, re-election in 2012 and Obama walked off the stage and gave him a hug. He was in the blue room uh, with just a few staffers and a handful of Obama's family when he did his uh, second term swearing in. It fell on a Sunday and they had to do the official swearing in before the big fake one uh, the next day out on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, he was uh, responsible for the atomic clock to make sure that they did it on time. Probably nicked it from the Pentagon or somewhere. <laughs> he was backstage with Obama when the president met the distraught relatives of the Sandy Hook shootings where 20 of the dead were five and six-year-olds. He was uh, on the plane with Obama uh, and the First Lady and George W. Bush and his wife to go to Nelson Mandela's funeral. He played a round of golf with Obama and got psychically <laughs> thrashed. <laughs> he sounds like a really competitive, competitive. sports yeah. yeah. Uh, and he was in the church at Charleston when Obama sang Amazing Grace. So uh, the moments in history, uh, Pat, uh, they're kind of astonishing. Uh, but look, let's start with presidential transport because uh, that seat on Air Force One, I'm obsessed with <laughs> Air Force One. Air Force One was definitely the top perk of the job, for sure. You, 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 you say that uh, travelling with the president was thrilling. Not even Fox News could get you down when walking up the stairs to the <laughs> president's plane. <laughs> It's very true. It was my seat was the the back of the plane, the very the last very seat. Back, yeah. The very back. The very back. The only person behind me was um, one of the chefs on the plane who was cooking our meals, um, and it was just the most bizarre experience. The first time I walked on Air Force One, it sounds people always say like, "Oh, that's surreal." It was truly a pinch me surreal moment. I couldn't believe I was getting on the plane. And there's this weird moment when you're when you're on the plane because there's TVs on Air Force One and they they carry. Uh, live television and they start to pick up reception again as you descend toward earth. So more than once uh, as we were coming in for a landing, you know, CNN would pop on and it would be covering the plane landing as we were on the plane. <laughs> and I was just like, my brain couldn't really compute what was actually happening. But it was, it was, a, it was a very uh, moving reminder of the power of the presidency every time I stepped on board. It, it really is a symbol of it, isn't it? I mean, when, you know, presidents, you know, bother to come to a little place like Australia <laughs> and that plane uh, lands. We, our great symbolic transport in Australia, Pat, is a thing called Simpson's Donkey. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what that yeah, is. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. But uh, we don't have in Australia those kind of symbols symbol. of power. Right. Um, and the way you you describe it, uh, I think, I think yeah, with the with at the right moment with the right president stepping off the plane, I don't think there's any more potent symbol of democracy than Air Force One. Of those moments, I uh, 
described where you were you were in the room. Which one, or perhaps it's another one that I, I didn't put on the list. Uh, you know, if you had to pick one above all. Um, well, two things. I wasn't in Charleston. Oh. Um, I was not there. I was at the White House, but I didn't take the trip. Oh, but the bad one. Bad luck. Yeah. But the one that was most. Probably the one that I'll never, I'll never forget a lot of them, but the one that sticks in my mind and I think about almost every day wasn't on the list. It was actually the day after the 2016 election when um, I was a little bit shocked and Donald Trump had won the election. Uh, basically, the night before we had, we had all gathered um, in the West Wing for a party because we thought that our time was ending, we were passing the baton to Hillary Clinton, she would continue what Barack Obama had been doing for eight years. So we were in the press secretary's office, which was just off my desk. Um, it's in this little weird sort of bubbly place called Upper Press. It's about 30 feet from the press briefing room and 30 feet from the Oval Office on the other side. And we were partying, we, we were in a great mood, we had begun to drink uh, heavily and we, uh, then the numbers started coming in and the results and state after state started going for Donald Trump and then things sort of changed and people were drinking for different reasons. They weren't celebrating anymore. And I remember I found myself alone uh, at like 12.15 in the morning in the Rose Garden, basically not passed out, but close to just passed out, just on the ground, not knowing what to do or where to turn. And I had this, this cracked glass of like bourbon sitting next to me just wondering, how is my time in the White House ending this way? This wasn't how it was supposed to end. And then I went home um, and I walked back in the next morning and it was raining. And it was a little bit like we were in some corny movie where like the weather matches the mood and it was, it was all too much. But we get in and we're back where we started the night before in the press secretary's office where we had been having a party. And instead, everybody is sitting around. Some people are crying, some people are angry. You and were bawling. I was not yet. I was holding it together, <laughs> but I started at the worst possible time. I, and then the president's assistant walked in, uh, expecting just to see Josh Ernest, the press secretary. But when she saw that we were all in there and we were having sort of a moment, she told the president, "You need to wait. They're they're talking." And so then, so the president said, "Well, what do you mean? Just send everybody in." So we all got up and walked into the Oval Office the morning after the election. And I had been lucky enough to, I was around for a while at that point, I'd been in the Oval Office uh, many times, but there were some staffers who had never been in there once. And so we all filed in and the president and the vice president stood in front of the Resolute desk and started giving us this sort of just hopeful pep talk that this wasn't the end of the world, we'll bounce back from this, history doesn't go in a straight line, it zigs and zags. And when he started to say it zigs and zags, I just lost it <laughs> and I was, and this wasn't like the sort of appropriate, poignant <laughs> crying where there's like a <laughs> tear coming down. It was like the ugly, like snot, just disgusting <laughs> crying to the point where one of my coworkers had to like pull me aside and like she gave me like a used like tissue. It was just disgusting. <laughs> but, the, but the speech was amazing. And then as if, again, it was out of a movie, the rain had stopped and the president turned to the Rose Garden and he said, you know, I need to address the nation and I want to tell them everything I just told you and I want to do it outside. I don't want to do it in the cabinet room. I want to do it outside because it's more optimistic out there. Um, and he asked if we agreed and we all said, yes, we did. And that was, that's probably the, the, the room I was in and the moment I was in that I'll take forever. Mm. Um, I, I'm astonished given, it, you know, your own role, but the, the people that you work with, I, the, you you really were so certain Hillary was going to win, and you referred yeah. to her for two years up until the election as the president in waiting. And uh, yeah. I feel like blaming you, Pat. I feel <laughs> like a, uh, how 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 could you have missed it? Um, I, first, with the caveat, I totally missed it. Like. 1,000% missed it. I had people coming up to me almost every day who weren't as involved in politics, and they would say to me, Donald Trump can't win, right? And I'd say, no, he can't win. The polls say he can't win. He's a crazy person. Uh, and of course he's not going to win. So after it happened, I did feel like, oh my God, I've just been pushing bad information. But I truly thought that there was no way 
that America would elect someone like Donald Trump to be president of the United States. It just was unfathomable. So that's why when it happened, it sort of shook me so much and shook all my coworkers. I do want to remind people though, just in defense of America writ large, that three million more Americans voted against Donald Trump's vision of America than voted for it. So America is, he's our president, but the majority of Americans are not with, with him and with what he's sort of espousing as American because it's, it's not, he doesn't represent the best of us or the majority of us. But I do take, you know, I just totally missed it. It was. Did everyone? It seems like. In your orbit? Everyone in my orbit. I mean, or we didn't all miss it here. Everyone in my orbit missed it. Um, and that's our fault. We just didn't see what Donald Trump had tapped into. And to Donald Trump's credit, he did tap into something. Um, I think he did it in a way that was, you know, racist and misogynistic. Uh, but he tapped into something and we weren't sort of on the cutting edge of what he he had figured out. Um, so yeah, we just missed it. And the, uh, by the way, the polls were also wrong. Like we weren't just pie in the sky dreaming. We were looking at the numbers, but the numbers were wrong. Um, let's go back to the um, much brighter day when you first walked into uh, yes. working for this administration six and a half years earlier. Yep. You are a 22 year old. Your parents are so excited. They're at, <laughs> on the other side of the gate waving. It was waving so lame, you. yeah. <laughs> it was very embarrassing. You shouldn't have your parents walk you to your first day at the White House. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, I mean, the context is that you, you had the lowest level job, but one with very high visibility. Right. So take us through that first media monitoring gig of which your predecessor, who was, you know, 24, I think, was <laughs> hospitalised for exhaustion, which is why you yes, got the my, gig. Yes, so my first official job as a staffer there was media monitor. Uh, and I, I'll never forget the day before I... the week before I started the previous media monitor who I was coming in to work with and eventually replace had been written up in the New York Times as, you know, the top media monitor across the, the district. So there was, I felt like a tremendous amount of pressure coming in. Um, but he had been, it's such a demanding job that he had been hospitalized for exhaustion after it. And what it basically is, is you sit at a computer all day long looking at the news and watching about 40 different um, websites and every time a new story pops up, you copy and paste it and send it across the administration to whoever needs to deal with the problem. So it's an extremely low level position, the lowest level position, I should say, the least paid. Um, and But your name is flooding people's inboxes, these important, super important people all day long. So everybody was seeing the name Pat Canan. Most people, by the way, before they met me thought I was a woman um, because you just didn't have visibility except for via email. Um, but it, so it was this unique position that helped me understand that the White House isn't just responsible for what's happening on Capitol Hill or at the Supreme Court. It's responsible for everything that's happening in the country in terms of news. And you're just expected, the president is expected to have been briefed on every situation. The press secretary needs to have a response. So it's just a overwhelming deluge of information. Um, and I should say that my successor also had uh, a health issue when her wrist was completely undone by excessive copying and pasting the control C, control V. Mm -hmm. I did not have any health problems, but that's because I was arguably the Obama administration's worst media monitor. And they quickly, <laughs> they quickly moved me out of that position. They, they put you way closer to the president, right, to yes. keep out of trouble. Yes. Uh, it's astonishing there's only one. I mean, I would have I thought know. like the Victorian government would have one media monitor, but the White House might have four. No, we only had one. For my first day we had, my first couple months or a couple weeks we had two, and I'll never forget on the first day my, the guy who I was coming to replace sent, I think, like 850 clips, and I sent three. <laughs> and I knew that it wasn't for me, but fortunately I got through it, and sometimes you fail up. So if you want to create some trouble in the White House, I guess you just find out when the media monitor's sick yes. and there's some stand-in who doesn't know what they're doing and you can create a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, you, then, uh, you then were promoted to press wrangler, which just, it just sounds like, one of the most awful jobs 
uh, on earth, I have to say. <laughs> so tell us about that one. No, comparatively. So Media Monitor was a position that was in the, the Eisenhower building, which is the big building next door to the West Wing. The, the press wrangler, I was shocked when they told me I could be a press wrangler because you moved over to the West Wing and you literally sat 30 feet from the Oval Office. And the, 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 the position is basically for the, United, for the American president, there's a press pool that travels everywhere with him, whether he is coming to Australia or if he's going down the street to his daughter's soccer practice. They have to be there in case something goes wrong, in case something happens, they just need to be there. And so when they, wherever they need to be, the Wrangler needs to be because the Wrangler is the person who is the go-between between, between uh, the president and the press. So, so the it president's, is, uh, he's playing around a golf on his holiday. Right. So you guys, you can stay in that we cafe. And, yeah, he, yeah. The president liked to play golf. Uh, and for a Wrangler who likes golf, it was very depressing every time he played because I had to go sit in the uh, cafeteria of Andrews Air Force Base and eat Taco Bell for six hours with the press um, while they had nothing to do except ask questions about like what holes he on. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, I just wished I was out playing golf, not sitting with them at Taco Bell. Uh, but it was really, it was one of the most, probably the most fun job I'll ever have because in addition to that sort of lame stuff, I got to travel across the country mm -hmm. and around the world with the president. I went to, I think 20 different countries and probably a hundred domestic trips and I, I got really lucky in that I was the Wrangler during the 2012 mm. campaign, so I saw that up close, all that craziness. Um, so really, looking back, it was, it'll probably be my, the best job I've ever had. How are the traditions of that pool going with Trump now? Because they were, you know, people wondered whether he, it's a tradition, it's, right. there's nothing in law, right? Well, that's what's, yeah, that's what's interesting, is it is a tradition, it's just a norm, and it's upheld only because people fight for it. So the press continues to fight for that coverage. Um, there's a whole uh, association that's in charge of it, but there is no rule mandating that, th that the president needs to be covered at all times, though arguably there should be given sort of the tendencies of uh, some presidents. But <laughs> this president, yeah. Um, but the, it's sort of shocking to me, the, the press pool still exists, they still do what they used to do, um, but the president just doesn't really engage with them. He's, I think, had one press, one solo press conference in his entire 14 or 15 months in office, which is if Barack Obama tried to get away with that, Fox News would have just melted down and it just would have gone crazy. So there, that's one of the things I worry about most with Donald Trump is the way he treats the media. Um, and uh, to their credit, I think they've done a really good job of covering him and fighting for access, and they've maintained that access. But there's only so much you can do when the president sort of calls you literally the enemy of the American people and you know spouts on about fake news all the time. But they, they've been incredibly important. Um, and we viewed them as incredibly important in our administration. We, you know, we got into fights with them all the time, of course. It's like, they, some days you could forget, like they, they are super annoying. Like, no one can follow up like a reporter can, mm. but it's really important for the country. And we never lost sight of the fact that we weren't the only public servants who came to work at the White House. The reporters who came in every day were just as important and doing just as much public good as we thought we were. You <clears> describe <throat> the briefing room as being exactly midway between the Oval Office and the residency. Right. So that the president's always got a reminder as as they're walking uh, back every, to their digs of yep. they're being they're being watched every day and, every day as they come to work down the colonnade and they go home from work they're walking along the wall that is the press uh, briefing room mm. so it's it, to most presidents it's a reminder that um, the press are really the conduits for uh, relaying what the president's trying to get done to the American people. Mm. You know, they're, that, that's just how it works, and they, they need to be respected. And you really were wrangling them, and you, you, you get that real sense of that relationship, that, uh, <laughs> and even in little things like the, um, uh, all the press, way more than could be accommodated, would want an invitation to the Christmas party. <laughs> right. Uh, but then you'd all get your own back 
dying for uh, invitations to the washing the, the correspondence right. dinner, which was theirs to to serve it back up. But there was sort of yes, that there is a whole DC social like life ecosystem that goes on, and one of the there's two main events. One of them is the uh, White House Correspondents Dinner, which I'm sure most of you have seen clips of. It's where the president gets up and does stand-up comedy. And the other one is... Uh, or, or invites Donald Trump to apply to be president. Yeah, mm, yeah. Bummer. That was rough. Was that your joke? No, no, I wasn't. That's lucky. <laughs> I, it was one of my goals to get jokes into the Correspondents and did, Dinner. And yeah. I did at the end. Not that early, so that's not my fault. Yeah. Uh, Whose fault was that? I shouldn't say. Go on. <laughs> We're a long way away. And some of my friends who've started a prominent podcast. Uh, oh, really? Uh, it yes. was them. I, that's my understanding. Mm, I don't know. Okay. Um, so, and Seth Meyers, by the way, he he's a he's a big NBC host in America, and he really lit into Donald Trump that year. So I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, but we're all paying the price now. Uh, but. Yeah, so those are the two big events each year, and they just sort of people just lose their minds. These reporters who are such respected heavyweights just would come groveling to like a 22 year old sitting at a half desk um, about how they need to be invited to the Christmas dinner, and sometimes they're just not space. Mm. Um, so it was it was a reminder that you know, for as much as we all uh, could get used to the grind and stuff like that, the White House itself, because they all wanted to come because they could bring a guest. And it's a reminder that, you know, put everything else aside, it's, it's crazy that we get to come here whenever we want. Um, so it was a nice reminder of that. And then, but we got, we got the flip side at the Correspondence Center because the reporters are in charge. So we, we staffers were all left scrambling for tickets mm -hmm. and it got, it got ugly as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you were promoted uh, uh, after some time as Wrangler to uh, Deputy Director of Messaging. Uh, tell, us, tell us what that, what is. that I, is. I love how open <laughs> America is about a role like this. I think in Australia we'd probably give it a slightly different term. Like uh, what was the, what I, the term? I don't know. Being? I'll have to find out. But more, uh, you know, to be something like communications, right. you know. Something or other. Officer, we had rather. we got to the point towards the end of the administration where there would be sort of like deputy under representative for writing and communications <laughs> with a side of this or that, and it was mainly because it was a lot of people who had been there for a long time, and the only way uh, to get a pay raise is to get a new title. Yeah. So they would give weird titles. That, was, but for me, it was a totally different job. Well, this for you is the first time that you have a responsibility of putting words right. in the president's mouth if he, if he wants them. Right. And it was I ha I held a really sort of, uh, sort of an odd kind of made up position, which was I spent about fifty percent of my time writing uh, for the president, not writing like his State of the Unions. He had chief speechwriters to do that, writing, you know, anything that could pop up. A, a death statement, that was a that was a big thing I did. I did, a, when people died, I wrote a lot of uh, Obama's statements, uh, op-eds, uh, random stuff like jokes, uh, just weird things. Um, and then the other half was this deputy director of messaging role, which was really determining how to use the president's time most effectively, and also figuring out what he was gonna say once we determined where you know, what interview he was going to do, who he was going to do it with, what the setting was going to be, um, were we going to invite real people, stuff like that. So I had, a, it, it was really fun for me that real I wasn't. Real people, I love Real that. people, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, it was fun for me because I could, every day was very different. Um, I, it's funny, I was just about to say, take us through a day. Um, uh. And obviously they are all different. But you you do describe that every day, while it was different, had the same sort of contours of the minutiae and the enormous. Right. Um, but how do you sit down at the beginning of a day to, to work out on that messaging? Give us a bit more of the nuts and, and bolts of right. it. And who do you work with so, in doing that? So I... Again, I was lucky because even though I moved through all these jobs after Press Wrangler, I never moved my desk. 
So my desk stayed the same, which was very important to me because it was right in the action and it's sort of, it was a terrible, you know, just wood plank and it was, sometimes I shared it with someone, sometimes it was my own, but it was right in the heart of the action. So I never wanted to move. And fortunately I never had to. Um, but the way the day would normally work is I would come in, I was usually running late. I was one of the later ones into the office. So I, the mornings always felt crazy and scrambled. Um, and I just, most of the time, didn't have a sense for really what was going to happen that day. We had some longer term plans, of course, um, but a lot of it was reacting to what in the world just happened on Capitol Hill or someone just died or we just got an re interview request from so-and-so. Um, so I worked most closely with the communications director who was, uh, when I first started, was Dan Pfeiffer, who sort of really sent me on my path of like, he really helped me. He's the one who got me out of the media, media monitoring job. Um, and then it was a woman named uh, Jennifer Palmieri, who was wonderful and went on to run Hillary Clinton's campaign. And then it was uh, Jen Psaki, who I also loved. And then the other ones I worked closely with were the press secretaries in my time. They were Jay Carney and Josh Ernest and also the, the director of messaging. So the person I worked most, most closely with was usually uh, the, the director of messaging. Um, and we would figure out everything from where the president should go in terms of what type of location, like what suits this event or that event, uh, who we should meet with. Finding, again, real people uh, was a big part of the job. Um, and then the other part was I had to, for every single, it was the bane of my existence, but for every single interview the president did, I had to write a memo to him, which was sort of outlining who you're meeting with, why you're meeting with them, what we hope to get out of this. And then I had to predict what questions he would get asked and then respond to them in his voice. And so sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it was fun. Most of the time I knew he was going to answer the questions 1,000 times better than I could in, you know, uh, late in the day trying to figure it out. But it led to weird encounters because we would do interviews with sort of some weird people. Um, like, I remember one time we were trying to sell the Affordable Care Act after the Obamacare website had gotten off to a bumpy start. Um, it didn't work, basically. So we went, we went on like a mad push to uh, figure that out. And we were sending the president on a radio show with uh, a guy who was really big in the hip hop environment in Atlanta, Georgia. And his name was the Mad Hatta. And so I had to write him a memo that said, Mr. President, you will do an interview with the Mad Hatter. And you're supposed to call him Mr. Mad, because that's what <laughs> he likes to be called. And so then I remember I wrote up all these talking points of like, what, what, what the president should say when Mr. Mad asks him about whatever. And my boss, I didn't brief him on this, fortunately. Sometimes I did, but not this time. But my boss, Jim Palmieri, went into the briefing, to the Oval to brief him with my memo. And she came back out, and her face was completely red. And I was afraid to ask her what happened. I was like, I can't tell if she's angry or if she had just been laughing. But I asked. I was like, Jen, what's going on? And she had just been laughing because the president looked at the memo and he flipped it and he looks and he's like, oh, Mr. Mad, yeah, makes sense. And then he kept flipping <laughs> and it was like a 20 page memo and he just kept flipping for dramatic effect. And he's like, let me tell you what Mr. Mad is not gonna ask me about. He's not gonna ask me about the Congressional Budget Office's assessment or estimate of the fourth quarter GDP growth. And there's this great picture that Pete Souza captured for posterity where Jen Palmieri is just laughing her head off and it was because of this dumb memo that I had written. But it was just a reminder that um, we sent the president to do some crazy stuff. And you just have to sort of adapt and be nimble. And the president can always pull it off. And we overthought a lot of things. But he could just pull everything off. The, the culture of the office, or, you know, the, where you worked in the, in the White House, sounds just fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, you write about the diversity. There were, you know, more women than men and uh, race was openly discussed. And, uh, and it, it sounds like a joyful, supportive, uh, incredible place to work. Uh, but if you can just take off, slice off that romanticism of, of, of how it reads mm -hmm. for somebody who wasn't there... Um, what made it strong, that culture? I mean, 
I had some. Well, I had someone ask me earlier today who had read the book. Well, was it just a politically correct thing to, that you all did? And I said emphatically, no, it wasn't because there was. It sounds corny, and it kind of is corny, but the pool of people and the pool of talent that was drawn to Obama, to my mind, was a little bit unique. It wasn't the typical D.C. people. It was people from all across the country, from, from you know, Iowa, California. My, one of my close friends was from Alaska. They were all sort of inspired by this bolt of lightning that they saw first in 2004 and then in 2007 when he was actually running for president. So to me, it brought about just people who wouldn't, they wouldn't work at the White House if not for Barack Obama. They weren't people who had gone to college with the goal of working for a congressperson, with the goal of working for a senator, and then moving to the White House. It was people who sort of, in some ways, uh, earned it but fell into it because they loved Barack Obama. Um, for instance, the uh, one of my friends uh, who's from Philadelphia, I'm from Philadelphia, um, and I should thank your city, by the way. You, Ben Simmons is... Uh, uh, from your city, and he is our star basketball player. <laughs> yeah, and he we, was a basketball fan. We've got a problem Thank keeping you. people like that. Oh, yeah, I we'll, apologize, but he's doing great if for Trump us. Totally wrecks America. He might come back. <laughs> Maybe. <yeah? laughs> um, but so one of my close friends uh, was named Disha Dyer, who was the president's final social secretary. So she was a big deal, and she planned, you know, all the events, the Pope's visit, everything was Disha Dyer. And at the beginning of the administration, she was a 33 year old intern um, who sort of, she had put herself through community college in Philadelphia in her early 30s and she had just totally changed tracks and decided that this is what she wanted to do. And it just made for really interesting, dynamic um, public servants who weren't in it for a lifetime of public service, but they were in it to do as much good as they could for as long as it would last. Mm. Um, the, the really obvious thing about the, the office it was the youth. I mean, yeah. 33 is old. That yeah. was old to us. Yeah, yeah very. Uh, this was, and you know, you're right that if the American people had known that this administration, <laughs> the country's being run by 25 year olds, they'd uh, right. they wouldn't believe it. But to a large extent, it really was true. Right. Um, in, and in that in that sense, you, you know, how much of the business of government in that setting is winging it. I, my opinion is everyone's winging it. Um, I think I, the first time that I, my first day, I, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. And I assumed that, for, to give you a sense of how much I had no idea what I was doing, my very first day, uh, started off with me not understanding how to work my computer because we had very old, outdated computers. The, the White House is, was very outdated. That's a whole other story. But we had old, outdated computers, and uh, I hit a button, and suddenly a huge, blaring advertisement with Justin Bieber came on my computer. <laughs> and he started singing on my computer, and I didn't have headphones in. And then he was dancing on like my desktop, and my whole room <laughs> turned and looked at me like I was just the craziest person in the world who didn't know what he was doing, and I didn't. And so I was super embarrassed, but I wanted to make a good impression to come back from that terrible Bieber-inspired embarrassment. <laughs> and so I had heard this term thrown around all day long, <laughs> and I didn't know what it meant at all. So I decided I'm not gonna Google this. I'm gonna turn to my coworker and you know, let him know that I'm an engaged person looking to learn and do a good job. So I swiveled my chair and I said, hey Matt, what's a POTUS? <laughs> <laughs> and my room just went silent. <laughs> and I knew in that moment that stupid questions do exist. <laughs> and I had just asked one on my first day at the White House. Uh -huh. And so to me, I knew, so, so fast forward to six years later, I knew that when I first started, I had no idea what I was doing. But when I first started, I thought that everyone who was sitting at a table with me had to be a genius. Mm -hmm. Like they just, oh, this person must be some sort of a freak genius since they're, living, since they're working here. And I know I just fell into it. But the truth is everybody in a way fell into it or lucked into mm -hmm. it. And as you get to know them better, you realize, yeah, they're super smart in some ways, but they're also weird and eccentric. But it doesn't make them any less worthy of being there. 
So yeah, I, I was winging it, and I think most people were. Um, you're writing now for a TV show, yes, designated Survivor, which I actually watch. <laughs> So, you know, it's because of the Air Force One thing, right? Yes. Uh, if you haven't watched it, you may not want to. might not be everybody's cup of tea. It's a bit ridiculous. Uh, but... Uh, uh, it is. When, you're, when I read your story, and, it, you know, that's, it's fantastic you, you're doing that and um, in on the TV, but when, when, I, when I read the book, I thought your story, your working story, reminded me of what it might be like to be a... Um, you know, an amazing, you know, footballer or an, so a young person who wins a gold medal at the Olympics uh, and then, you know, you, you turn 28, 29 mm -hmm. and you, you're walking away. Do you feel like you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to find that? How do you not spend the rest of your life trying to look for that feeling again? Oh, man. <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> uh, I think subconsciously I knew that, that this was probably the best job I'll ever have. So really what I did was... Uh, it may not be the best job you ever have. I'm sure it won't be. Your, I think it'll be the most... experience. The experience. most meaningful, mm. insane experience I'll ever have uh, in terms of a job. Uh, I think subconsciously I knew that because when Donald Trump got elected my the day before his inauguration my wife and I started a drive across the country we left Washington DC um, <laughs> no coincidence uh, but I I think that the truth is I would have left DC even if Hillary Clinton had been elected because you're you're right in DC you're just chasing you know politics is all-encompassing it's a company town um, and nothing to me was ever going to live up to the Barack Obama White House um, because it was I know it's the only one I ever experienced, obviously, but I think it was unique. Um, and even if a career politician got in, you know, eight years from now uh, and I go back in some, were to go back in some capacity, it wouldn't have that same magic that, that the Obama White House had. So, I, so I'm trying to do something totally different, which is why I've gone to move to Hollywood and I've been writing and doing that. But, but yeah, I think I will in some ways always be thinking back on this time. I mean, I guess it's a problem you share with Obama, who's still a young guy and yeah. uh, has decades of, of, of working life um, with him, within him. We have a, a, a really different tradition to the States in Australia with former leaders. And, I mean, one of the main reasons is because there's only three ways it ends if you're Australian Prime Minister. Uh -huh. You get booted out by the people, you get booted out by your own party, or you die. I heard... Nobody ever resigns. Nobody ever says, yeah, it's been great. You know, really? I think I'll... Yeah, no. There's no fixed terms. Somebody, there's no fixed terms. I, you can keep going forever, and a couple of them have tried. Uh, I did it... One, it ended. It ended in death, or you know, one of the. Well, yep. Well, one of the interviews I did before in this morning, the the guy said, because I was talking about how we were in Sydney and we were uh, doing beach stuff, and he was like, "Oh, only one prime minister's died in the ocean." Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. just started, yeah. I yeah. just started laughing. Yeah. And then, he, then yeah. the no, it's true. Then the air clicked off. Yeah. And he was like, "No, that was true." Yeah. And I was like, uh, yeah. oh, "Sorry for laughing." Yeah, and. Just be careful because it was a Victorian beach, not a Sydney one. Too. Oh, You're closer to it here. Yeah. No, it, it's happened. He's not the first person to die in office in Australia, but uh, Yikes. mostly, I think, in bed other than Harold Holt. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it, it, the, the point I'm trying to get to is uh, we have no respect for former leaders mm. here, I think, and it's a, it's a serious... Shame, right? Uh, because we miss out on a on a wealth of experience, which I think is better coordinated uh, in America. I mean, even the tradition that you never refer to the former president; it's always uh, Mr. President, right? Uh, and that they're kept in the loop on uh, high security um, things and so on, so they can always be there as a resource in a better way, in a sort of formalized uh, way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 
it's a tradition we could really steal from uh, from you, I think. I think there's a really nice, um, just sort of watching it develop on the news, really, there's a nice camaraderie among former presidents, even presidents who used to be just totally at each other's necks. Um, like the, the Bush family has all but adopted Bill Clinton as like a surrogate son. Um, and it's this bizarre thing, but it's sort of really nice to see. Um, I, I have a sense that uh, after this presidency, there will be an odd man out of that camaraderie. <laughs> uh, but, I, but him withstanding, or him aside, I think uh, it's, it is a really nice tradition, and people really do respect the former presidents. Mm. I guess you're not going to tell us how Obama really feels about Trump. I don't know. Mm. He, mm. I, haven't, I haven't worked for him in a while. Mm. Yeah, I have friends who work for him. Uh, there's a um, beautiful story in the book of you proposing to your wife Stephanie in the Rose Garden while you were working there, one of the perks of uh, such a, a job, and yes. a hilarious story about a staff uh, photo uh, call that they were at the very end of the of the the days for the staff who, as your parents put it, stayed around to turn the lights off. Uh, they got a special photo call with a loved one and you so, pushing your then fiance. Was it, were you married by then? So or? this was it was before the it was before the final photo. We did a separate we did a final photo at the end that went much better. But my first photo, my first time I had my then fiance meet the president, he got uh, he called her in and he, put his arm around her, and they were about to take a photo, and then the president waved me over to, to jump in, and I said, no, 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 and so I didn't do it. And then the president's body man was like, you gotta get in there, and the president was like, come on, and I was like, no. And, as I, and then finally he waved me over a third time, so I was like, okay, I have to go over. And so I'd already made enough of a mistake by not getting in the photo, but then I thought I need to explain myself, why wasn't I gonna get in the photo? So my rationale in my head was we were engaged, this is a once in a lifetime photo for Stephanie. What if something didn't work out with us? <laughs> I didn't, I thought I was being super like gentlemanly and considerate, but apparently I wasn't and it didn't go over well. Yeah. Oh, so great. I'm in the photo by the way, and Stephanie crapped me out of the photo uh, when she put it up on Facebook. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask you one more thing before I throw it open to the uh, audience to ask some questions. To, get, it's, to go back on something you just touched upon earlier, uh, and that's the 2012 re-election campaign. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what you learned about what it takes to get a president, and this is re-elected with the advantage of incumbency. Right. What does it take? Um, it was, it takes so many things going right. It, it's essentially a, this has been, people have said this before, but it's a startup, a, a presidential campaign is a startup on steroids. It's a billion dollars spent, thousands of babies kissed on the forehead, um, too many commercials to count, and it's a bunch of people coming together doing their one job the way they have to do it. Because I remember I was a wrangler for the 2012 campaign and it, the press secretary, I remember, pulled me aside and said, and the other wrangler side and said, like, you can't think of yourself as a press wrangler or an assistant. You are the like outward face of the administration to the press. You cannot do anything to make them, to give them reason to doubt us. So, and I'm sure he was saying that to every person who was involved. So it takes, hundreds of people, thousands of volunteers feeling that way, feeling invested in it. Um, and then, then, of course, there's the other more political stuff about uh, having the right message at the right time and the right candidate. Um, but it really is just a massive, massive operation that I just got thrown into and it felt like just being in a whirlwind. And it was just a great learning experience mm -hmm. and I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> 
Um, if you would like to ask Pat a, a question, put your hand up and speak if a microphone goes in it. Great. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, look, uh, thank you for your talk. I've enjoyed it. Um, I'd just like to know if you think that um, tweets eh, are, have done or are doing or will completely take over from press. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> it seems that, yeah, it's happening already. I don't know. So I uh, joined Twitter only after I left the White House. And I was... An, Unfortunately, I have become a little obsessed with Twitter, which my wife doesn't like. But I, I was shocked at what Donald Trump was tweeting. And so I did, about last summer, I saw, he did a, he did a tweet. It was a typical Trump tweet. It was totally bizarre, non-presidential. And I remember my job at the White House used to be that I would write up the presidential statements and I'd format them to look like a presidential statement. So I just decided like, hey, I'm gonna take one of these tweets and um, put it in the format that we used to put our presidential statements in. And it sort of took off and went viral because it looked, it just is so jarring to see the president saying something insane, but under that banner of statement from the White House and in the correct font. And, <laughs> and then some dude on the internet found it and was like, hey, I'm gonna create a bot that turns all of Donald Trump's <laughs> tweets into uh, official statements from the White House. And he did, and it went crazy, and there's like hundreds of thousands of people following it. And it was just a reminder to me that, no, I, I think that, that we're in a little bit of a unique time where we have, or America has a little bit of a unhinged person uh, uh, working in the Oval Office, and he can tweet anything he wants, but most people have come to realize that uh, it doesn't usually turn immediately into policy or ever into policy. And the press is doing a very good job of continuing to uh, report aggressively and report facts and not be deterred by quote unquote fake news, which isn't a thing. Um, so I don't think it'll take over, but it's been a bad development for us. Can it be unwound, do you think? Like, or has it changed forever now? I, I am sort of optimistic that it can be unwound in the sense that um, future politicians won't be able to get away with the things that we've let Donald Trump get away with, but I may being, I might just be being a little bit too optimistic about mm -hmm. that, but that's my hope. Like, I don't think that other politicians, I don't think a Marco Rubio could get away with an affair uh, with a porn star named Stormy the way that Donald Trump can. And I, I hope that um, that's the case going forward. Um, down Hello. the back and, um, and then up the front here, please. Uh, me? Yes, yeah, you yeah. first. Um, I just wanted to take you back to talking about writing death statements and thinking about that in the context of I'm presuming you did them after a mass shooting and we look at gun control in the US obviously with a fair degree of surprise and I think have an assumption that a president like Barack Obama had a different view about gun control than what he was actually able to say publicly and I'd just be interested in how you can reconcile what you would think about his authenticity and sincerity in not really being able to prosecute a gun control agenda but making a public statement after a tragedy like some of the mass shootings that occurred on his watch. So I, well, my, my death statements were, um, the ones that I was talking about before, just for more context, were like if when uh, a famous representative died or a celebrity died and we had to put out a statement uh, where the president sort of does a mini eulogy for that person. So that's the, that's the term death statement. But shootings were something that we had to deal with way too often. And the president eventually became known as the consoler in chief um, because of how many times he had to deal with this. In terms of the authenticity of what he could say uh, and what he did say, I actually don't think there was a, a big divide. I think the president, um, that President Obama was pretty straight with the American people in terms of um, that, you know, these are completely preventable attacks. So what I always found striking about the way he approached them was he would eulogize the people who were killed and he would say that this is a very sad day 
um, and he would sort of do the usual thing that every president will do. But in the very same speech, he would also say, but this is preventable and this is what we can do. We're, I, I'm sending up legislation to the Hill or this or that. And he was uh, shocked. I think he has said this, he said this before publicly that his biggest frustration was after Sandy Hook where when 26 people were killed, including 20 you know, first graders, uh, that Congress still wouldn't act even when, because the, the thing about the authenticity question, the American people, 90% of them, not 90%, close to 90% of them are for additional gun safety and gun control measures. But the Republican Congress is sort of owned by the National Rifle Association, which has outsized influence in America. Um, so I think it was an area that frustrated him immensely. And he even, I remember he got up to the podium a couple of times and literally was crying at the podium. So I think he was pretty open about his thoughts on gun control and the way the, the, the debate had gone in the non, the inaction from Congress. Mm. Um, there's somebody here at the very front. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Pat. Um, we hear a lot now sort of about politics really becoming more about kind of personalities as opposed to genuine kind of policy. And I just kind of wanted to know what your views are on that. How important do you think it is for people to have that kind of personal connection to their leaders? And do you think perhaps it's gone too far in the sense that politics is now sort of more about a soundbite or about the sort of celebrity of a politician as opposed to genuine kind of political achievement or endeavour, I suppose? Yeah, I think the answer is basically both, which is um, the personality of a candidate is extremely important. Um, people don't really want to talk about policy, uh, unfortunately. They want to uh, feel connected to whoever's running, and they want them to have a good story and be personable and feel like they understand the person who's voting. Um, so I think it's really important, and it rightly should be. But I also think it's gone way too far. Um, just to give you sort of an example, I think that a lot of people didn't vote for Hillary Clinton because they didn't feel inspired by her. Um, even though I personally was inspired by her becoming the first female president of the United States, but a lot of people didn't think she had the spark or feel inspired. And I think that that's lazy on their part because I, I think that you should uh, actually, I think that voters have a responsibility to learn the policy, learn if the person's qualified uh, and vote on that, not feel like they need to be um, struck with some sort of inspiration the way Barack Obama did it. Which but Obama would disagree with you on that, I reckon. He would say, no, it's your problem in the communication. You're not getting it right. He wouldn't blame the voter. I think you, you might be right, um, but I think that he... I think that he has said that it's not just about um, who, who inspires you. It's, it's great, it's such an added bonus, and it's why I got it, it's the only reason I'm si sitting up here is because I did feel inspired by Obama. Um, but the, I, we might, Barack Obama and I might disagree on this, but I think that there's more, there's an incumbency on a voter to um, learn more than the surface level about the person who's mm. trying to run your country. You know we have compulsory voting here, Pat. Yeah, I learned that today, yeah, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. Yeah, when Barack Obama came to Australia, when he was leaving, someone asked him what he'd most like to take back with him, and that was his answer. Our America would look very different if mm. we had compulsory voting. Mm. Yeah, Australia would look very different if we didn't. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, great, it's a great thing, compulsory. It's so undemocratic and so great. Uh, if we got, yep. Sign. Great. Um, from an outsider's perspective, there seems to be a war going on between New York Times, Washington Post, New Yorker and Donald Trump. Um, do you think this is true and how do you, if it is true, how do you think this will play out? Um, I think there's a sort of a war going on between Donald Trump and the American media um, that's been... 
I obviously I think I've been clear about how I feel about Donald Trump. I think that's a, a war that's been wholly instigated by Donald Trump. Um, I think that it won't play out well for the president. I think that uh, there are too many good reporters doing good work. Uh, and like I said before, they, they follow up. <laughs> they, they ask uh, over and over, so they're not going to give up. Um, and I think that, you know, as they do more reporting, more, more information is going to come out uh, about the president, good or bad. I happen to think most of it will be bad. Um, so I don't think it will play out well for the president. And I, my hope is that it will prevent future presidents from going to war with the media because I don't think it's smart or good for democracy. Mm. Hi there. Do you at all anticipate um, uh, Trump being impeached? And if so, are you more or less fearful of a, pre of a Pence presidency? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's a chance that he'll be impeached. I don't think anyone in America should uh, assume that he will or rest on their laurels thinking, oh, special counsel, special counsel Mueller is coming to the rescue. I think that Americans... Uh, need to organize and get out and vote, which they are. Things are really turning, and you know the the special elections are showing that probably the Democrats are going to retake the House. Um, uh, to answer your question, I am less afraid of a Pence presidency, only in the sense that uh, he is just simply not unhinged. I thoroughly, <laughs> thoroughly disagree with with Vice President Pence's views on most things, especially social issues, even more than Donald Trump's views, because I don't think Donald Trump really cares that much uh, about social issues um, one way or the other, which is fine, uh, but Vice President Pence has very set views about the way sort of American family life should be that I just disagree with. Um, but I still, Donald Trump uh, to me is a unique uh, threat, whereas Pence isn't. What are, are the Democrats getting their act together in looking for somebody that is, you know, not going to be Mark Zuckerberg or Oprah Winfrey to uh, <laughs> counter Trump's second uh -huh. run? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that person... Uh, it's not apparent who that person is. No one has really sort of moved away from the pack. I think there's some usual suspects. There's uh, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris... Uh, Vice Pre or yet yeah, Vice President Biden, um, I think could still make a run. There's Elizabeth Warren, but there just hasn't uh, Kristen Gillenbrand. But yeah, nobody to my mind is the person yet, mm. and I don't know when that'll be. You loved Biden, didn't you? Was really... Yeah, Biden was yeah. super cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one more. Um, David from talks a lot about the fact that uh, the repercussions of the Trump presidency are not so much the stuff that he can state while he's in office, but the erosion of the dignity of the office and the erosion of uh, institutions that kind of protect uh, American democracy. Do you share that view? Can you, are you sort of going to be forever demeaned by him having been president? Um, I think it's really sad that he's president and that you have 50 million people, however many, 70 million uh, voted for him to be president. Um, I think that the office will bounce back. It's the most important office in the country, arguably in the world. Um, but it, yeah, it feels like it, it does feel like the office has taken a hit. And my hope is that it'll bounce back. But seeing, it's shocking to me almost every day uh, how he acts as president. I didn't think, he, I, I was totally against him when he was running. And still I thought, oh, he won't be as bad as he is as a candidate, but he's worse. Uh, one more. Is that you, as a press wrangler, you'd know, you know, you don't say one more and then right. one more. Because <laughs> right. I know I've set myself up now for something. Uh, <laughs> so you, something else you probably ought to worry about in Australia is we don't have primaries, um, or if they are, they're very private within the party. Um, and it's been said that the primary process damages any candidate moving forward before they take on the, the other party's challenger. Um, do you think that that is something that is um, sort of uh, makes the democracy in, in the US more fragile? Um, well, I think 
arguably no, because both sides have to go through that damaging, uh, the, the damaging, and then they meet each other damaged. So it doesn't <laughs> tilt it one way or the other. But I do, I think there's an argument to be made that it makes the candidate stronger because it makes them have to have these arguments and get to the best possible policy points. Um, that said, I do think that the primary damaged Hillary Clinton um, before she got to the general to face Donald Trump. Um, but I think it's sort of a little bit more case by case. It would, because all of that stuff that comes out is gonna come out in the general. So arguably, it's better to have it come out earlier, further from the election. But I do think it's sort of case by case. But it was, it was a damaging primary uh, in 2016 for sure. Mm. Uh, I could just sit and talk to you for just hours and hours yeah. and hours, uh, but our time is uh, already up. Uh, I uh, wish you, and I'm sure everybody wishes you all the best in whatever you're going to do next. I mean, it's going to be a surprise, isn't I it? I don't but, know, yeah. You know, yeah, but, you know, keep writing designated survivor until you work out what it is. <laughs> yes. And uh, the book is uh, West Winging It, My Time in President Obama's White House. Uh, it really is, you do feel like you're in there. It's, I'm it's glad. Really, I, I would expect it to be well written and it is. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I wish you all the best with that as well. And thank you so much for coming to the Wheeler Centre. Thank you. I think this we're the great. only people to get you uh, live at an event uh, while First you're one. in Australia and we're really thrilled to bits. So please thank Pat Canan. Thank you. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.